So today we have uh, uh, a very special guest, the elephant seal. These are the, the, the males anyway, three ton uh, uh, behemoths. Uh, you can see them next to some king penguins there. Can I get rid of them? I don't like them. <laughs> and uh, the way they organize on the beach, so there'll be one of these bull males surrounded by a harem of female seals and pups. And uh, they have a sort of melty appearance when they're on land and all kind of crowded together. And that may be because the uh, male seals kind of jealously, like we saw with the first seals, guard their section of, of beach. Uh, they make these kind of loud uh, bellows uh, and they will also rear up to their 10 feet, uh, 10 foot height to kind of try and uh, keep other, other males away. The, the brown penguins there are uh, juvenile king penguins. And uh, like the, the fur seals, the elephant seals do come, come to blows, just slamming into each other to try and win that section of beach. And this is like serious business. They, uh, the males will have all sorts of scars from these, these beach battles. But uh, the conflict is not, not limited to male seals. Female seals also, also get into it. Um, but the babies are very cute, uh, even though the, the, the baby seals might be practicing for their, their future battles. All right. Those are some seals, Silas. Are they 10 feet high, like, are they 10 feet long, or are they 10 feet high when they get up on their way? Uh, they can get 10 feet high when they rear up. These are, these are, they're like the size of a car. John? Uh, couldn't tell you. They're probably not that different. Uh, any non-animal related questions to, to start us out? All right, let's uh, do a bit of practice with our kind of virtual memory system uh, before getting into the main topic for today. So no, no cards on this one, but please uh, work with your neighbors to figure out, given that we have a one megabyte byte addressed machine, that means one megabyte of physical memory, where each byte of that memory has a unique address, so one byte, one megabyte, sorry, of physical memory, four megabytes of virtual memory, and the pages are 128 kilobytes. So to remind you, a kilobyte is two to the tenth bytes, a megabyte, two to the twentieth bytes. And so given this setup of how much uh, physical memory, how much virtual memory, how big each page is, that's enough to determine how much is our virtual page number, our physical page number, and our offset, where we were taking our n bit address, dividing it up into our virtual page number and our page offset. We're performing a lookup in our page table, which was giving us our physical page number, and then we were combining that with our page office offset to get our physical address. So physical address here, virtual address here. So work with your neighbors to figure out how many bits our VPN, VPN, and page offset will be in this system. All right, let's break this down. So if we have four megabytes of virtual memory, that tells us 
uh, how many different bytes there are in virtual memory. So four megabytes is going to be how many different bytes? Exactly. That our virtual memory two to the twenty-two bytes, and as usual, we're going to want an address for each separate byte, byte address memory, and so. How many bits would we need in a virtual address in order to be able to refer to 2 to the 22 different bytes? Alternative. Yeah, we see, right, we have 2 to the 22 different bits or, or bytes in virtual memory, and so we need 22 bit addresses to be able to refer to that many different bytes. So our n, in terms of the size of our virtual address, is going to be 22 bits. We can do this same process with physical memory. How many bytes do we have there? 17. 2 to 17. In our oh, physical... sorry, I can't. Yeah, so did you mean the page? Yes. Yeah, so our page, we're going to have... 128, 2 to the 7th, times a kilobyte, 2 to the 10th, gives us 2 to the 17th, which means that our P, the number of bits in our page offset would be 17. And that needs to specify an individual byte inside one of our pages. And then our physical memory, how many different bytes are in that, John? Two to the 20, right? Exactly. Just one megabyte, two to the 20, which we know means often uh, sometimes written M. This whole thing, 20 bits. This whole thing, 22, P equals 17. And, yeah, Jay? Um, how did we get to it? So there's one megabyte of physical memory that corresponds to two to the 20th different bytes, and each different byte needs. Is it always going to be one megabyte, or how do we know it's one megabyte? Uh, that's information I've given you about the system. Um, right. Given a one megabyte byte address machine, there's one megabyte of physical memory. Uh, so, yeah, might be eight gigabytes on on a modern laptop, something like that. And so with one megabyte, that's going to take 20 bits to give unique addresses to all those bytes. Uh, and with now we have enough information to figure out, well, if the offset is 17, what's left over, 22 minus 17 is 5. Offset is still 17, because it's the same offset in both addresses. That leaves 3 left over for our physical uh, page number. As a check, we'd say, okay, how many of these 128 kilobyte pages fit into our physical memory? And it would be, well, there's two to the 17th bytes in one page, two to the 20th bytes total. That means two to the third pages. Just divide two to the 20th by two to the 17th, gives us two to the third. So having three bits then to specify different pages is consistent with, with that. Eric. Um, can you explain again how we like how the X component tells us like n equals twenty-two? Like what's the relation? Yeah, so how do we know that if we have 2 to the 22 bytes that we need 22 bits in the address? We might look at a smaller example um, to, to, to see this. So let's say we have um, a memory that has just four locations. And we index those locations 0, 1, 2, 3. If I rewrite these in binary, 
I would have 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And so I can see to represent four different addresses, I'm going to need two bits. And that's because each bit has one of two possible values. So with two bits, I have each bit has two possible values, so I get two times two as the number of different combinations of these bits I can make, two to the two. And if we had three bits, we would have two times two times two different combinations, or two to the third. And so if we want to have an address that can have two to the 22 different combinations, we want two times two times two 22 times, that gives us our 22-bit address. Does that make sense? Yes. What other questions do you have? So today there are a couple, uh, couple topics. Uh, the first is exceptional control flow. In normal execution, we go from the ins let's say the instruction K that we're executing. at address k. Normally, the next instruction, k plus 1, is just the next one in memory. That's kind of how we normally execute assembly. Instruction at one place, we go to the next one. Jumps, calls, returns. These might change this kind of just go to the next one, they might send us to somewhere else in memory. Uh, these all depend on internal program state. And so they're what we call normal control flow. Just program doing what it is supposed to do, what it wants to do. So our our exceptional control flow is events from outside of our program interrupting or taking over from the from the normal control flow. So So there might be events from outside the program that sort of interrupt this normal con control flow to do something else. Uh, there might also be the program might also deliberately hand control over to uh, uh, often the operating system outside the program. Uh, and there might be an event that the program causes that triggers some exception, some diverting of our control flow outside of the program. And kind of these different aspects uh, they underlie many parts of uh, how our system functions. Last time we talked about uh, a program accesses a virtual address that hasn't been loaded into memory. It isn't in physical memory yet. That triggers a page fault, which is one of these events the program causes. And this will hand control over to a part of the operating system that's going to load that page into memory. A program might divide by zero, might access memory it's not supposed to, also events it causes. These events outside the program might be things like uh, data arrives over the network. 
and the program, it, and, and this needs to be to be dealt with, and, and maybe some other program needs to run to handle this data that came in, or uh, but uh, various input output events uh, would be would be examples of, of this. And then, in terms of the program handing over control, we're not going to let programs do whatever they want. We're going to set up uh, our systems where we have the hardware kind of at the bottom, our, our memory, CPU, disk, network, all the, the hardware components of our system. And then on top of that, we're going to have something called the operating system kernel. And this is going to be a trusted part of the system, as in the operating system kernel has unrestricted access to the hardware. It can do whatever it wants. We trust that it's not going to screw things up. And then on top of it, we have one or more applications. And these applications might be kind of well-behaved and friendly. They might be very confused and doing sort of like random or weird stuff. And ah, they might be evil and malicious, kind of out to out to out to get us. So we're never going to trust the applications uh, with unrestricted access to the system because. Uh, they might not know what they're doing, or they might be trying to do something bad on purpose. And so any time one of the applications wants to do something that involves the hardware, they're going to have to ask the operating system kernel to do it for them. And the operating system kernel will go do it, and then return control to, to the program. So this is what this hand over control part of exceptional control flow is, is our, our program might say, I want to open a file. This involves going and reading something from the disk. Well, our, our application isn't allowed to kind of directly send uh, information to the disk hardware component. It has to invoke a special kind of function called a system call, which says, all right, I'm going to turn control over to the operating system kernel to perform this task. Hands, program hands over control. The trusted kernel does the file input output and then returns the necessary information to our application. And so this structure of, of operating system kernel is also how our, our virtual memory is, uh, is functioning in that our application makes a memory access that goes through that MMU and data structures managed by the kernel to translate into a physical address. And our programs are never uh, directly accessing physical memory uh, without the system, the operating system kernel being involved. John? How does the, how does the OS kernel know like, what type of behavior is malicious like that it should be allowing? Uh, how does our kernel know what kind of behavior is malicious? Um, so these system calls uh, will check all sorts of things about the arguments that are passed in. Basically, uh, and if an application uses a system call in an inappropriate or invalid way, the kernel just won't, and it's in control of what happens and what doesn't. Um, so 
the kernel doesn't have to kind of anticipate. Well, so writing these system calls is uh, a really important kind of design aspect because you need to make sure that they are uh, robust, that they check the validity of all arguments, that they're not going to uh, to allow bad things to happen. Other questions? So, our picture of what's happening is our user code is going along and we're at some Some current instruction, and uh, kind of one of these three things happen: an event caused by the current instruction, an event happens outside the program. This instruction is one of these system calls that's handing over control, whatever it is. We have our, our event, at which point our Exception occurs, transfers control over to code inside the kernel, and the code that responds to a particular exception is usually referred to as a handler, so a page fault, one of our types of exceptions, so the kernel includes a page fault handler, some function that gets called in response to a particular exception. There'd be a handler for divide by zero. There'd be a handler for various kinds of uh, input or output that interrupts a program. Once this handler is complete, uh, there are three, three, things, three things that might happen. So we might We might return to the current instruction. We also have a next instruction. We know what that would be before this exception occurs. So we might return to the current instruction. We might return to the next instruction, or we might avoid. And just say program is over. We're not. We're not. We're not going back. So, in the case of these first two, we're returning to either our current or our next instruction. In the case of a board, we're just exiting the program, and we're never returning control uh, to to the, the user code that triggered this exception. So which of these we do depends on what kind of uh, exception we're dealing with. So we have four kind of categories of exception. So our type uh, could be an interrupt. Could be a trap, could be a fault, or an abort. So these different types of exceptions will have different causes. Uh, an interrupt is typically some sort of input-output signal. So if we think back to the memory hierarchy, uh, how our, our accessing something on disk was orders of magnitude slower than accessing something in memory. Like memory took hundreds of cycles, hundreds of instructions that the CPU could act, uh, execute, accessing di disk tens of, of millions of instructions. 
So if our user code goes and needs to read something on disk, it's going to have to wait a while before that information is available because it takes a long time to read that on disk. And so having this, having our program be able to uh, sort of be paused or suspended and then be woken up by some sort of interrupt uh, that says, hey, the information is now available. Uh, is uh, is the sort of kind of input output uh, here? We might also think about uh, whether the uh, exception is asynchronous or synchronous. Does it happen? Uh, Synchronously as part of an, an instruction our program is executing, or asynchronously, meaning this kind of could happen in the middle of, uh, of an instruction the program is executing. It's asynchronous would be kind of not tied to uh, the uh, flow of, of the program. Our, our interrupt would be asynchronous. Whenever that information comes back from the disk, that's our interrupt. It's not tied to the kind of step by step that our, our program is doing. Our trap is our intentional kind of exception, like our system calls, uh, where we're just deliberately handing over control to the operating system. Um, and uh, the terminology is, is the code traps into the kernel, turns control over to there. Uh, and this would be synchronous, since this invoking of, say, a system call is directly caused by some instruction or program executes. It's not kind of happening uh, outside of, of that flow. Our fault is. A potentially recoverable error, whereas an abort is a non recoverable error. And these, in both cases, triggered by some instruction that our program is executing. And when we think about kind of which of these three, each of these kind of uh, 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 each of these kind of exceptions uh, returns to our interrupt and trap. These uh, are interrupts, even. It's asynchronous, happens any time, but it's going, we're going to do it once the current instruction finishes, and then we're going to come back to the next instruction after that. So interrupt, and a trap is like a function call, except we're going not to some other user function, but into the kernel. So that's also going to come back to the next instruction, just like our, uh, normally we would return to the next instruction. Our fault is going to come back to the current instruction, or it's going to abort. Uh, and an example of that would be uh, our page fault. We've accessed some memory address that's uh, not valid in the page table. Uh, if it is a page that we can load in from disk, the page fault handler will do that. And now the system is in a, in a state where that memory access can succeed and will return to the current instruction. It will attempt that memory access it, again, this time get a page hit and not cause an exception. If that memory access was invalid, it's to some spot that the program is not allowed to access, well then, we're not going to return control, and we're just going to abort. So depending on the, the nature of the fault, uh, it might be potentially recoverable or, or not. 
are abort, something that, that is never recoverable. So that would be an, an example of that would be um, something like a hardware fit. So our program is, is, is going along, uh, it executes an, uh, it attempts to execute an instruction that's uh, not, uh, not legal or as part of executing that instruction, some hardware component in the system fails, uh, there's, there's no recovering from this. Uh, we just abort the program. What are your questions on this? Kevin. I don't quite get why it interrupted the asynchronous. Because if I'm like, asking for a file, wouldn't that mean that it's caused by an instruction so it's synchronous? So that's, that's a, a useful distinction. So we might kind of set our IO in motion through some instruction. But in the case of our, our disk IO, this is going to take a really long time to finish. And so our, um, uh, and so our system is not just going to sit there doing nothing while it's waiting. It's going to uh, continue with uh, uh, with other currently running programs, or the program that started this input output continues with other things. Um, and then sometime later, we need to interrupt whatever the system was doing in the meantime to say, "Hey, the disk read is finished. Like, here's the information is is ready for the user to to give to the user." And so that sort of interruption of, hey, the disk read is finished, that is just depending on how long that disk read takes and is not synchronous with the instructions the CPU is executing. Other questions? All right. Um, so, other kinds of, uh, of I.O. would just be any sort of user input. User hits Control-C on the keyboard. User clicks the mouse. Um, uh, these things are not synchronous with uh, CPU instructions and kind of would, you would need to interrupt uh, a program to say, hey, the user clicked the mouse or uh, when you hit Control C in the terminal, it sends one of these interrupt signals to the program to be like, hey, stop. So our, um, uh, our some examples in, in yeah, so that's. Uh, so is this, are the exceptions not caused by current instruction? All the time. I mean, because in the case of the control C, that's not like user code that's causing the thing to stop. Uh, yes. Yeah, so the pro the user code will be at some current instruction, which may or may not be the cause of the exception. Gotcha. Um, in the case of our our, our trap fault or board, it will be. Yeah. In case of an interrupt, it will not. Gotcha. So uh, some other some other. Examples um, are kind of uh, uh, an example of a fault would be divide by zero, and different systems could recover from this. Decide to uh, uh, return not a number or, or something like that. Unix opts to abort, so if a program divides by zero, or if uh, the the destination of some uh, uh, of some floating point arithmetic, is, or the result of some floating point arithmetic is too big for the destination. Uh, these both generate floating point or floating exceptions that will abort the program. And our our page fault can either kind of trigger a segmentation fault, abort the program, or successfully load a page into memory and then. Restart the current instruction. Oh. Is it possible for like, interrupts to abort the program? Like, for example, like, if you control C a program and it kills it, is it not because it aborts it, or like, is it because it goes to max? Um, yes, yeah, so, so uh, a, um, 
That's fair. That that are are interrupt um, uh, will uh, could cause the the program to to end. Uh, I believe that. Uh, the user code kind of gets control back at which point it terminates the, the, the program. Um, but yes, I think that I have to, to look into it to, to be sure because it may, it may be that our, our control C um, as a program can uh, implement its own uh, handlers for various signals. So you may have encountered on the bomb lab that if you hit control C while the bomb was running, it had a, a silly message about, hey, you're trying to control C to end the bomb. Uh, that's because that program implemented its own kind of handler, not in the kernel, but a handler for the um, uh, interrupt signal that control C sends to a current application. And so it could, uh, you can make a program ignore a, 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 a Unix interrupt signal and then control C wouldn't necessarily do anything. And so kind of by default programs terminate when they get this signal. Um, but I actually have to look up, is that termination handled in some default handler that's in user code or is it that the kernel never returns back if there's not a registered handler. I'm not, I'm not sure. Other questions? All right, so this is how uh, the sort of exceptional control flow is handled, how these outside events happen. Uh, so kind of second topic for today is uh, up until this point, I have been uh, uh, kind of describing currently running things as uh, applications or, or programs, uh, but the actual model uh, on uh, this common across many different operating systems is the process model. And a process is an instance of a program in execution. So VS Code, for example, uh, that I would say is a, a program, and then you might have multiple kind of VS Code windows open at a time, all kind of working on separate files, etc. And kind of each of those windows would be a separate process, a separate instance of a currently running program. And each of our processes has the illusion of its own uh, uh, private memory and CPU. So, each process thinks it's head, it has its own memory uh, with things like the stack and the heap. And the process also has the view that it has its own CPU with its own registers. And so our, so I have multiple processes that all have uh, this illusion that I have my own private memory, there's no one else using it, it's, I have this whole virtual address space uh, to do whatever I want with. When I access a register, it will have whatever I put in there, um, 
and so on. But our, uh, our reality is that processes don't have their own memory. Our system just has one single uh, uh, physical memory uh, where all of these, uh, the, where the memory for our various processes are all kind of living together. And we don't have uh, a separate CPU and registers for each process. Uh, what we have is just one CPU with one registers, and then as part of memory, we're going to keep track of the register values, we're going to save the register values for a particular process as part of its memory, which is how our system is going to be able to run multiple processes at once. Because, for example, it's the case that uh, on my laptop, I may be running uh, VS Code and Spotify and Chrome and Slack and whatever else. And all of these, I can interact with them. Spotify can be playing music while I'm editing the VS Code, while something is compiling in the terminal and all these different things uh, can, can proceed and they don't interfere with each other and I, as the user I have the illusion that all of these processes are happening at the same time. And what is actually going on is we have our make this a little bigger. We have our uh, uh, memory with our different processes, and we want to switch from running, running one process to some other process. So we take the data that's in the registers for the current process, stick that in memory, and then load the saved registers from another process onto the CPU, and then this will include the instruction pointer for that process, so then we can pick up executing wherever that process left off. This uh, uh, procedure of switching from one process to another, saving uh, the state of one process, restoring the state of another, this is called a context switch. Our CPU switches the context in which it's executing so uh, that we can uh, switch from only one process to another. And since our CPU can execute uh, billions of instructions per second, it can switch between two processes in a kind of imperceptibly small amount of time and thus give the user the illusion that all the processes are running simultaneously because we're just running one for uh, a few milliseconds, running another for a few milliseconds, running another for a few milliseconds, and kind of switching between them so that we have this uh, uh, perception of kind of they're all happening in parallel. Questions on any of this? You know. If like one of them, like for one of the stack, like, um, if you can't process it in like milliseconds. Um. So you're saying what if, what if the program is using too much memory? Um. So. Uh, In the case of what we're, what we're changing in memory each step, uh, saving registers, restoring registers, that will be very fast. Um, if a program is using a ton of memory and we haven't been running it lately, 
maybe we've paged out some of its memory to disk to make room for, for other stuff. Uh, and uh, then we go back to, to this process. It starts using its memory again, and it keeps hitting page faults, needing to load uh, uh, new chunks of memory from disk. Well, remember that our disk I.O. being very slow, we're not going to want to sit around and, and wait for that. So let's say this process hits a page fault, and then it starts reading from disk. In the meantime, the CPU can go run another process. And then when this interrupt comes in saying this disk uh, uh, information is now available, we can switch back to the process that was uh, using it, that needed that information. Um, and so our ability to switch between processes, run one while another is waiting for something, uh, is very, very useful. That means that we can sort of hide uh, the, this sort of lag time. Yeah, Michael. Um, so if you have multiple like, cores in your CPU, like you have you have four programs running, like actually running at the same time instead of just like one kind of being run that's seeming like it's two. Uh, exactly. The, in a in a multi-core system. This picture would then have multiple of these CPU boxes, and they all could be switching around to different processes. So having multiple CPUs, yes, lets us actually run things in parallel, not just make it seem like we are. Other questions? All right, one uh, picture of this kind of illusion of things uh, being, uh, having the appearance of uh, happening at the same time is that uh, if we run process A, switch to process B, it finishes, switch to process C, switch back to process A, the user doesn't uh, necessarily observe these sort of gaps where we weren't running process A, because they are small enough, uh, because we can switch between these very rapidly. Here. You mentioned that, uh, like, this is case, like if you have Spotify open and then running Spotify, like you're listening to the song on Spotify, but it's like stopping for milliseconds at a time. But like, you it? How would the music be continuously playing? Uh, that's a great question. If uh, some process has uh, needs to, pro to provide continuous output, how might it do this? So this uh, the, the the hardware in our system uh, uh, will typically have um, uh, little bits of, of memory itself, or the capability to associate part of memory with that device. So in the example of Spotify, the app might uh, buffer, fill up an array with the next uh, second. Uh, one second, minute, however much, like fill up some buffer with kind of the next five seconds of music to play. And then the, uh, uh, the audio device will just be reading out of that buffer for what for the uh, for what sound output, uh, and then all we need to do is to switch back to Spotify within every five seconds for it to put more music into that buffer. Uh, so uh, this is a very common kind of design, uh, often called. producer consumer where some part of the system is uh, uh, kind of producing data to send to some other part or uh, and so in this case Spotify producing output data filling up some array with it and then our um, Our audio device is the consumer reading data out of this buffer continuously to, to produce sound. Uh, 
And many places in our system will have this sort of design where some part is uh, producing a set of tasks or a set of data for some other uh, part. And there could be, uh, and it's not always just a sing single producer or a single consumer. Uh, there might be uh, many producers or many consumers or, or many of both. And there's just some data structure that one side is putting stuff in and another side is uh, getting stuff out. Other questions? So, one other picture I'd like to show you. is this kind of uh, graph of how our uh, context switch uh, is going to happen, how we go about switching from one process to another. Uh, this is going to involve um, uh, uh, accessing kind of uh, re restricted parts of memory, stuff that we don't want our applications to be able to mess with. So when we switch from one process to another, this is something that the kernel is going to handle this sort of saving registers, loading new ones. Um, and so when process, when we want to switch from process A to process B, that's going to trigger an exception. The kernel is going to perform this switch and then return control to process B. That executes. Then at some point later, we have another exception and we switch back to A. There's a um, special kind of interrupt called a, a timer interrupt, which is there's just something on the CPU that every 100 cycles, 1,000 cycles, something like that, will just generate an interrupt. And this is so that the CPU has the option to then switch from running one process to another at these kind of regular slices or regular intervals. Uh, because our uh, our interrupt is what is going to transfer control from the currently running user program uh, to some, some handler, giving the kernel the opportunity to decide to switch to running some other process. So that is kind of the most common kind of exception this would be, would be this like timer, except timer interrupt that just happens at a regular interval continuously. Christian? Uh, when your system is running multiple processes, will your CPU give equal running time to each process, or will it like, oh, I noticed that the Spotify music buffer is getting low, so now I'll switch over to Spotify, build the array with another second of music, and then I'll do some other stuff and link them back to like the next second. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, what process should we run next, or for the next uh, 10 milliseconds, say. Uh, this is a kind of deep question that our operating system needs to answer, because it's what's, uh, our kernels, what's deciding on which process to run next. Uh, the set of algorithms or techniques to, that would be used to decide this is called scheduling. Uh, what you mentioned is we're going to give equal time to all, all processes. That's uh, uh, called round robin scheduling. We just process A for one millisecond, process B for one millisecond, process C for one millisecond, back to process A, just kind of going around. But we might want other, um, other scheduling uh, uh, algorithms to uh, ensure different properties of, of fairness or to avoid any particular process of just never getting a turn. Um, and uh, we'll spend a fair amount of time talking about scheduling in our, the operating systems course next term, because that's a, a key function the operating system needs to provide. Other questions? All right, there's uh, one uh, little demo that I'd like to do. Uh, 
I bring up a terminal. And go on to the AWB 66333 machine. This is the, uh, the machine that was uh, hosting the or providing the, the lab, lab two and three infrastructure. And uh, we can do, uh, we can use this uh, built in uh, Linux time program uh, to tell us both how much time something took, but it will also tell us how many page faults occurred while the program was running, which is sort of neat to see. So GCC, that's our C compiler. So if I run it like this, we see it tells us both major and minor page faults. And so it says there were 10 page faults that required, say, reading stuff off the disk, that's I.O., uh, as part of running this GCC program. Because the code for GCC is on the disk, and we had to load it into memory in order to run it. But now that I have run it once, that code is already in memory. So if I run it again, there were zero page faults the second time around because all that code was previously loaded into memory and hasn't been kicked out yet. Uh, I can actually, because I have administrator access to this machine, uh, execute this uh, command, which will uh, tell uh, uh, the operating system to uh, uh, flood, get rid of all the pages that have been cached in memory. Now that I've done that, if I run GCC again, I'm back to needing those 10 page faults to load it back into memory. So this is just to show we can actually look at a real program on a real operating system and see uh, that it does trigger these, these faults to, to load code into memory or other data that it needs. Questions on that? Oh. Can you see how this can this other capital get to me? Very unclear caches. Is that also all of the tabs when the cache first? You also have to have page faults to get to the memory? Like, um, which I just thought of when it was still. And then I also had to add like a couple page faults as soon as you ran that to get to the that yes, when I ran that, other processes running on this AWB uh, 66333 uh, system, which is just like a desktop computer in my office in Olin, uh, other processes running on that would also have like had to start loading their pages back into memory. Um, but I haven't kind of experimented to see if that happens. All right, so there's uh, kind of last um, interesting bit of kind of process control that I, I want to talk about with our remaining time. Um, so on on our systems. Each process on, on Linux is identified with a unique ID or PID, sure for process ID. So if I in the terminal here, it's a little bigger, I bring up a kind of list of, of currently running processes. We can see both what the process ID is um, uh, and who the user is that's running this root being the kind of administrative. Uh, user AW, AWB being me, so we can see that this HTOP program has process ID 4751. The user is me. Uh, it's uh, kind of priority and, and niceness. Uh, niceness is like how much it tries to, uh, how greedy it is about getting resources from the operating system. Tells me how much virtual memory, how much physical memory it's actually using, how much CPU it's using, how long it's been, it's been running. Uh, and 
one question we might get, ask is, well, how do we create new processes on the system? Right? How do processes come into being? And kind of one uh, one uh, important way processes uh, get created. is with the fork system call. And a, a, the fork system call, the kind of intuition for it is, kind of comes from the name. So one process going along, and fork is going to split it in two, but then kind of proceed in their own directions. Um, fork is a distinctly strange function in that It's called once and returns twice. Because it returns to the parent, our original process that called fork, and to the child, to the new process that we just created. And our child process is running, is a, is a copy of our parent process. So fork splits off a new, creates a new process that's uh, a copy of the original process. And to the child, Fork returns zero to the parent. It returns the PID of the child, which means that when we have fork, you all you call fork, and then you'll uh, say if the return value is zero, then do what the child's supposed to do. Otherwise, do what the parent's supposed to do. So it allows us to kind of split off our process into two that are copied, but then using the return value, which is different, they can then go in different directions. And because our operating system is in charge of which process gets run, it's in charge of scheduling, uh, this parent and child created by fork can be interleaved. We can switch back and forth between them in any order. So we don't, we can, for example, assume that kind of the child's going to run first or the parent's going to run first. So that's one way to create a new process. And exec, another system call, which has many different versions. A common one you'll see is exec ve, and the different versions just take different arguments. Uh, in terms of kind of control, uh, controlling its behavior, um, but this exact system call says turn this current process into this into running this other program, and. With these two together, there's a nice example of this uh, in, in the textbook. Uh, we can actually have uh, like, a, like our terminal, uh, our, our, like this uh, uh, terminal I have on, on AW, uh, the AWB machine, uh, it, this, this uh, terminal is a process just like any other. But I can run commands in the terminal and cause them to be executed. And one, uh, one way to do this is with a combination of these two things. That when I say, like, run the ls program to list the files in this directory, this uh, says, OK, I'm going to, the, the terminal will call fork, create a second copy of the, of the, the terminal program. And then in the child, if 
fork returns zero, call exec to turn the child process into, in this case, the ls program. And so the terminal is just every time we execute a command, forking off another process and then turning that process into uh, whatever thing we're running so that we can kind of, so that it can be creating new processes to handle the commands that we're, that we're executing. Uh, and uh, based on how we run the command, the terminal might wait for it to finish before we can enter a new command. We can also say, uh, 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 don't wait for it to finish. Immediately return, uh, let us enter a new command uh, because the command we're running is a separate process. It is not going to block us. All right, that's all our time for today. Uh, it's kind of a quick overview of uh, these kind of uh, details of how our system's going to work. Um, keep working on uh, the Malik Lab. I have office hours 4.30 today. Uh, and on Friday, we'll talk about how uh, files and other input output work. And I'll see you then. Thanks, Aaron.